explain, let me explain a bit uh, uh, what I do. But uh, as you go through the lessons, you will understand a bit of my story. So uh, it's going to be fun, it's going to be interactive, so uh, let's see what happens. Now, uh, when you talk about marketplace, right, uh, some people think that the darkest place on planet Earth is some temple or some medium, some, some small medium or extra large or some witch doctor over the other side of the earth. But actually, if you want to look for the darkest place, you just need to know what Jesus is talking about. When he talks about, uh, if you look in the gospel, there's only two times that uh, one time Jesus said this person is in hell. The other time, Jesus says this person got once his life, in, not in a good way. Yeah? Now, so uh, the first time will be Luke chapter 12, verse 16 to 21. Uh, uh, he he talk, talk, tells the parable about this man, a certain rich man who yields an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what should I do? Uh, I have no place to store my crops. So he built bigger barns. He stored the surplus. Then in verse 19, he said, I said to, my, he said, I said to myself, uh, you have plenty of grains, grains left for many years. Take it life easy, drink and be merry. And then God said to him, you fool, the, this very night, your life will be, be demanded from you. So this one, God wants his life. So uh, if... If God wants your life and God wants to kill you, not very good, a very good idea. Yeah? Yeah? So uh, now, the, the interesting thing about this parable is uh, he only think to himself. The only person in the parable was him. No other people, no God, no other people that are less than him. The only problem with this parable is he think to himself. So he's a main uh, character that is everything that is around him, he is consuming, he is hoarding. Yeah? So it's a marketplace thing. Now, uh, Luke chapter 16, verse 19 to 31, which is the second one, which uh, we are very familiar. Uh, the rich man and Lazarus, the beggar Lazarus, right? Uh, who backs day and night outside this rich man's gate uh, uh, and, and longing to eat uh, at the, and something that fell off the rich man's table, but somehow uh, the rich man didn't feed him. He died. Uh, but uh, interestingly, the beggar was at Abraham's side, but the rich man died and was buried was in Hades, and he was tormented. He looked, uh, and so now it's interesting that both in both cases, right? This is the only time where Jesus identifies someone who is in hell, which is also a marketplace person. The problem is you have one percent of the world's population owning almost fifty percent of the world's wealth. World's health. Wealth, and that is a problem. The problem isn't not enough money. The problem is hoarding. So in these two cases, right? May I suggest to you the darkest place isn't some temple. The darkest place is actually the marketplace. And we need to understand that the greatest warfare, right, and the greatest darkness actually is actually in the marketplace. And we somehow didn't realize it. But as you look at what Jesus is saying, right, it's definitely a very dark place. Now I, um. So for tonight, right, what I am trying to do is bring you through a process where I'm going to introduce you a tool that we use in, uh, uh, I work with authentic life and authentic business, yeah? So we bring Holy Spirit transformation into marketplace, into different companies, and we see the Holy Spirit move, yeah? Talk is cheap. You need to show a system and a structure that works through the power of the Holy Spirit. So uh, we are doing that. So tonight, I'm doing one of the exercise. It's called core process. Core means who you are and out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? Uh, guard your heart for out of it flows the issue of life. So we, the core of who we are, right, is how we process things and we process things out according to what is inside. And that is important. Yeah. Uh, now, when I got saved, I, I have a very strange life up to now. Uh, for, <laughs> I got saved in 1994. Uh, Ronnie Howard Brown came to Singapore. Yeah, I don't know whether you know Ronnie Howard Brown. Yeah, uh, he came to Singapore and uh, I got saved. And someone gave me a Bible the next day. Uh, it's called a Life Application Bible. How many of you know Life Application Bible? The Bible they're so big, right? That you, when you throw at someone, they get injured. <laughs> Remember the Life Application Bible? Yeah. And so I, for some strange reason, this guy somehow managed to get Rehab Bunke to sign the Bible. 
And so uh, he gave me the Bible and I opened up and it says, you're called to be evangelist. And so I have no idea who Rehab Monke is, number one. I have uh, only see the poster and say, wow, this is interesting, right? And then, um, so I have no idea what evangelist is. Uh, so I kind of like do research a bit. Google is your second best friend beside the Holy Spirit. So I do research and says, okay, you're supposed to talk to people. So I, I got saved in Cornerstone. So I decided to sign up for who, what, which ministry can I just talk to the people, right? Uh, so I signed up for Usher. Now, when I smile, I don't look good. <laughs> yeah? And so uh, I said, oh, hi, how are you? Great. Uh, and then they give me numbers to follow up, you know, like church, you give you numbers to follow up visitors. So I call. Uh, because I don't know what I'm doing, right? I call this lady and say, hi, how do you, uh, do you enjoy church and all the stuff? And it's great. So suddenly I ran out. They never give me protocol. I don't know who to call either. Yeah? And so I, I didn't know what to say after that. There was this long pause. I said, uh, and, and uh, I actually then say, what, what do you have for lunch? And so that sounds like a stalker statement. <laughs> Which she's like, there's this another long silence. It's like, uh, sorry, I need to go. I need to hang out. And in my mind, I was like, I'm not cut off for this job. I don't know what I'm doing, right? Like, uh, <laughs> yeah, this lady, this person a bit strange. It's like, yeah, creepy. Yeah. God made creeping things also. And God made every creep. Yeah. <laughs> Just to let you know. Uh, if you're not familiar with my teaching, Sometimes it's just good to laugh because I use humor to teach. Yeah, so just in case you want to laugh, it's okay. Yeah. Um, so I want to kind of research about this. Okay, eventually, what? Okay, a stage, uh, auditorium, uh, crusade. That's that's all I know, right? So it says, okay, I'm called to do what stage, uh, uh, evangelism on a stage, crusade, uh, sinner's prayer. Okay, fine. Uh, but the thing is, when you think about it, right, if the, the stage or a crusade or a stadium, uh, you need a higher stadium, wow, that's very expensive. In the end, right, your calling is not a lifestyle, it becomes an event. So you live forever through your life, right? Just looking for that three-day event on stage where you become the most alive of who you are. The core of who you are suddenly rise up and say, this is what I'm called to do. But that is only a two-hours event. So for three days, for two hours on the stage, for what one year of preparation, you are become the most alive on stage. That's who you are. But then that, your calling is not an event. So what do you do after that? That's why we, the church, need to change our model. We understand that it's very easy to say amen on Sunday. Because in a mass consciousness, it's very easy to agree with one another. God is good all the time. All the time? Yeah, it's very easy. On Sunday, praise the Lord, brother, God is good. He's so good to me. Yeah, and then um, it's easy to say amen and praise the Lord on Sunday, but it's harder to praise the Lord on Monday. But that's what we are after because if we can bring the praise of the Lord that is on Sunday to Monday, suddenly atmosphere will shift, marketplace will start to transform. The goal is how to get the supernatural lifestyle or the Sunday miracle, the God-believing miracles that can happen in the church out into the marketplace. Therefore, your Sunday life and your Monday life has no difference. I know there's a huge stretch, but the gifts of the Holy Spirit is not just ministry skills, it's life application skills. The more we start to realize that it's life application, not ministry, we will stop training people only for ministry skills in church. And we start to train people how does the prophetic, how does the hearing the voice of God looks like in the marketplace. So therefore, because we only spend two hours in church on Sunday every week, for the rest of the 90 to 95% of your time is no longer spiritual activity? No, because in the, Jew, in the Jewish culture, everything is spiritual. So somehow the church needs to help marketplace people translate who they are on Sunday and make them effective on Monday. So I was thinking, but this doesn't make sense. What drives me, I'm an evangelist, then uh, if there's no stage, what should I do? then I'm not myself? That's quite miserable, though. So I was asking the Lord, and I, somehow I bumped into this man. Uh, his name is Israel. Israel is an actor. He acts in the Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, Dead Man's Chest. So he became quite a, 
uh, well-known actor uh, at the time when Dead Man's Chest came out in Pirates of the Caribbean. And so, uh, and the agent actually called him. Now, Israel is a praying man. So, it's, while, while he was praying, Lord, which, sub, which movie should I kind of partake in? The Holy Spirit told him, you need to turn down the first two and take the third one. Which doesn't make sense because you are you show up in fame, you should keep on going and keep on driving the momentum. So uh, the agent, w- uh, which was a Jewish lady, called and said, "Israel, we uh, this uh, there's this famous U.S. director is come is coming. He want to meet you." And Israel said, "No." And the the the, the, the manager was like, "What are you doing with your life?" And so, never mind. So then, this, uh, a few days later, the second phone call came and said, Israel, there's this guy, there's this director, famous director, horror movies that want to meet you. Like, you should meet him. And he says, no. And then the manager was like, in just, just plain language, what in the world are you doing with your life? And so Israel says, I don't know how to tell you, but my God tell me to turn down the first two and take the third one. And, and she said, I hope your God is correct. He says, well, we serve the same God, you're a Jew, right? <laughs> and, and so, the third one was BBC. Uh, the, the CEO of BBC decided to step down, and they gave him a project to do. Whatever you choose, you want, we will, we will, we will fund it. And so, the BBC, director, uh, the BBC CEO decided to have one project, which is a passion play. And he said, the passion play is going to be in Winchester City. Yeah, and so on Christmas Eve, he called Israel. Israel picked up the phone and says, Israel, I want you to play Jesus. That is number three. So Israel took the job of playing Jesus. In Winch- you actually can Google about this. Passion play at Winchester. It was so flooded with people, right? They didn't know how to handle it. And God told Israel before he started to play Jesus and said, you're not going to play me. You're going to live as me. So he went down on the ground and the Holy Spirit came on him and uh, the, the makeup artist saw him and said he didn't know what to do. Like, what, what's going on? Call the wife and says, like, your husband is on the floor. Uh, the wife says, that's a good thing. Don't worry, he will get up. And so he got up and he, as he played Jesus, right, I'm telling you, uh, now, uh, you actually can Google this. There should be some YouTube clips. As she, he walked past the town, as he walked past the city, as he carried the cross, right, there was this BBC uh, reporter that says, I don't know what's happening. The actor Israel who is playing Jesus, everywhere where he walked, every single person is crying. And now I'm crying. And Israel heard that. There was this lady that came, and she is supposed to wipe the tears off Jesus' eyes. And uh, she did that. And then Israel, for some strange reason, that they look at her and say, thank you. And she burst into tears and she ran off. Nobody knows what happened. After their play, BBC, for the very first time, was flooded with phone calls from everywhere saying they, got, they saw the skit, they saw the passion play, they want to get saved. The hotline was full. Yeah, it was like people keep calling in and says, what do we do? Which church should we go? One month later, the lady who wiped the tears off his eyes called call back and says, Israel, I don't know whether you know what you did. You did something that is, you didn't do during the rehearsal. You look at me, you stare at me in the eyes and you say thank you. Now, I don't know what happened when I look at you, right? Those eyes are not your eyes. What you didn't know was I was... Abused by my father when I was very young. Sexually abused by many people. I lived a life of shame. I was suicidal while my friends called me to audition for this passion play. So I did. It was a small role, but I did it. So I was here by accident. But when I saw your eyes and you said thank you, it feels like every darkness and every pain and every depression left. And now I can tell you I'm not suicidal anymore. I'm set free. So he was sharing this 
story to me and said, wow, that is interesting. But how do you get to where you are? And how do you understand the core of who you are? That every day you live life as an adventure with God. And so he decided to uh, show me this exercise. Now, this exercise is called core process. Now, it's very simple. Uh, so he asked me, and the same way I'm going to ask you right now, think of three happy stories over your life. Think of three happy stories that give you a lot of energy. You know God is in it. Since we are all Christians, now we do it with non-Christians, we do it with CEOs, we do it with different people. But since you all are Christians, so you can actually think of three happy stories when you get saved, when they give you the most energy, suddenly it give you the buzz when it's finished or when you, maybe you pray for someone uh, and they got healed. Maybe you pray for 10 people and, uh, to pray for healing and 10 people die. <laughs> but if you pray for 10 people and 10 people die, you definitely have a gift of bringing people to heaven. That's very good for you, but don't pray for me. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good evangelistic too. Yeah, heaven is a beautiful place, so I don't know why we are so scared to go there. Just to let you know. And so, um, it can give you the most joy and excitement. It could be small things like sharing a meal or feeding the poor. But something that you, you can remember for the longest time, every time you remember, there's this drive, there's this thing that says, that is who I am. So I think about it. I said, well, I have three stories. I have three, very easy, I have three stories. Uh, first story was, uh, number one, um, uh, about four years ago, we, we, we have a lot of cancer healing. Yeah? A lot of cancer healing through prayer. Uh, and so, a lot of our testimonies got spread around uh, by, uh, and a lot of people that got healed are not Christians. Yeah? And which is exciting for us. So, one day, this guy called uh, my friend and says, I want to meet your pastor. And uh, because my HR is sick, so I want him to do whatever he do on her. So, I met him at, uh, near Holland Village. And so we sat down. The HR has stage 2 breast cancer and she has two kids. She was crying and said, I don't want to die. I, I want to see my kids grow up. I said, I totally understand that. So, but let, let me pray for you. So I pray a very fast prayer, like 20 seconds in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, the guy was vaping. He was vaping. Uh, vaping. Yeah, it's obvious that he's not a Christian. He's vaping. And he looked at me and said, what? Well, finished 20 seconds, finished. And he looked at me and said, huh? So fast. You see, what do you mean so fast? You, you ask for a pastor. You didn't ask for a medium. I don't need to burn joystick or whatever, right? Yeah, I'm a pastor. So just let me do my job. Yeah, so why don't you go and uh, go to the oncologist and just check it out? So she went to the oncologist in three days' time. The breast cancer was totally disappeared. That She was miraculously healed. So this guy decided to call me and says, Pastor, I want to meet you. So we met at 6th Avenue. This Italian restaurant, very nice Italian restaurant. Uh, people were having their romantic date there. I was sitting down and the guy was late for 45 minutes. Now it is like, the waiters were looking at me and said, this is some poor thing. The date never come. You know those feelings that someone play you out, right? It's like, wow, the date never come. It's very sad for me. Said, no, no, I'm waiting for someone. And somehow, there were about 10 sports car, like at least 10 sports car that kind of uh, stop in front of the restaurant because uh, there was techno music and it was loud and there was disco light. I don't know what's going on, but there was about 30 people that came into the Italian restaurant. All have tattoos. Some has face tattoos. Some has uh, all of them have tattoos. I don't know why you get face tattoos. If you put a butterfly when you are young, when you grow fat, it becomes a moth. So sometimes I don't understand people's life choices. You know, sometimes I don't understand people's life choices. Like, I mean, you, you put an eagle there, like 50 years later, you become a, you become a chicken, it, it goes fat, your, your body goes fat. So, Nick, why, is, why, why face tattoos? I don't understand. And so, uh, it was strange. There, there were 30 of them sat down. Now, the waitress at that moment was a bit scared. Like, it's like this guy is going to get beat up or something. Like, they were also very scared. Like, don't know what's happening in the restaurant, right? And he sat down and... Uh, and he still, uh, he looked at me and says, okay, pastor, so how do you do it? I said, actually, it's very simple. There's your way, your medium, small, extra large, your witch doctor. If it doesn't work, then there's my way. If my way doesn't work, or maybe medicine doesn't work, then there's Yahweh. And he said, huh? Yahweh? He said, yeah, Yahweh. No way. Yes, Yahweh. Yeah, actually, Yahweh knows everything. He says, really, Yahweh knows everything. 
is I, I understand and I found out that he is his family started the biggest triad in Singapore. The biggest secret society in Singapore was started by the family. So when he says these are all my associates, so I jokingly say, so your your work culture, everybody needs tattoo, is it like <laughs> is it a requirement? <laughs> So he said, uh, well, I, I understand you're very familiar with your mediums, so, but uh, let me tell you that God knows more details than your mediums. Uh, yeah? So this is L-shaped road. There is this signboard, number 20, unit number 20. There's a point block. There's uh, floor number 5. What is that? He said, oh, that's my new office. We just move in. Like, how do you know? He said, Jesus, tell me. No way. He said, Yahweh. Yeah, I already tell you, Yahweh. He can know every single thing. And so he said, oh, then you need to meet my father, which was a founding father of the, I don't know, you, you know, like there are many different gangs, there's 369, there's 18, there's, you go and guess, yeah? So, and so uh, we went to the house and uh, the godfather was there, he sat down and he says, uncle, uh, 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 I'm just going to pray for you, I'm just going to pray for you, uh, and I'm going to pray for your wife, and the wife actually got healed of cancer, by the way, so two cancer healing. And uh, I started to tell him, like, in 1988, you fight in Geelong Long 27. There's, uh, yeah, you, uh, you have your gang. In 1995, suddenly half of your gang started to wear suit and tie. Uh, you started to make the business proper. And he says, that's correct. We, we actually IPO the, uh, the, the company in 1995. He says, okay, uh, that's very good, though. And he said, by the way, like, um, can you, do you do house cleansing? He says, what do you mean? He said, my house have an evil spirit. So, but do you do... No, I want to call my feng shui master. But he said, never mind, I can do it. No problem. Well, I, let me take care of it. So I brought my friend who is a prophetic artist. So she paints lions and eagles, Christian artists. He said, we bring five paintings into the house and we kind of place it everywhere. Like this one place opposite Buddha and all the idols. This one place it. So in the house that started the biggest gang in Singapore, now there is this five prophetic paintings all over the house shifting the atmosphere. Now, the interesting thing is, two weeks later, it says, Pastor, do you do demons? I say, what do you mean do demons? He said, I got this demon-possessed lady, like uh, one of my associates got demon-possessed. I said, yeah, yeah, I do demons. Uh, one week later, it says, Pastor, do you do family counseling by uh, marriage counseling? He said, yeah, yeah, we do. So we end up talking to, we end up doing marriage counseling with gangsters. And sometimes, you know, they are, you know sometimes gangsters, when they get married, right? Their, their life, their marriage life is also like gangster. Like I said, oh, you piao me, piao me, leave one, leave one. Wow, it's very drama. So it's really very drama. And so I have to, and by the way, to, two days later, I'm going to clear out this guy's idols. Who was formerly a drug dealer? And now attend New Cree. Not Old Cree Church, New Cree Church. Yeah? Yeah. And so, which is really exciting. And, and suddenly things started to happen and he introduced me to many, many different places. And so I got connected with very, very strange people where we were in dinner and, and he looked and said, you're better than my feng shui master. I said, absolutely. Like, and he said, can I invite you to a dinner? So I went to the dinner, and there were eight tables there, and there were Peter Lim, there were many people here, and there's this very, very interesting people. Then there are, there are the, all the Hong Sing Da Jiang, Zoe Te, everybody, the whole table there has won, won some awards. And I was just sitting there and said, why am I here? I thought it was supposed to be a family dinner, and there are 80 people. And then there was this lady that was next, door, next table next to me. She's a very strange lady with an iPad. So uh, my friend Cassandra C, she came in and said, Pastor, you're here. He says, that's very good. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you see this lady here? She's the number one feng shui master in Singapore. He <laughs> says, I think you're here to do something. He says, I think so too. So the whole night, people go to her. Then after that, people go to me. So, and so we have this very interesting showdown, which was very exciting. To the point where right now, the, one of the biggest triad in Singapore now is, I mean, they are still around, but less, it's more quiet. But they are feeding the poor. Every two, two, one week, two HGB block feeding the poor, which was fun. Because you have like tattoo people, then you have one row tattoo people giving chicken rice, then you have, the, the, then you have this, all these auntie and uncle, like, a bit scared, paranoid, right? Like, like, this <laughs> and it was really interesting. He sent me. Uh, he sent me a prayer. He sent me a prayer saying, Lord, I might not know who I am, but 
but I put my life into your hands. So I trust in you that I may not know tomorrow, but I open my heart to you. He prayed himself. He prayed it himself. And by the way, they now, I just went to their chicken rice store somewhere in town. They now, they started to open chicken rice stores everywhere, which is good. It's better to sell chicken rice than drugs. Like, which is, this is the wealth of the unrighteous to the righteous. Story number one. So, okay, very interesting. Uh, and story number two was, uh, and, and Israel said, okay, that's very interesting. Story number two is uh, I was in um, London. Uh, my friend says, would you like to visit the, the place where the Freemasons actually begins? They said, absolutely, let's go. So we went there, we prayer walk, uh, we worship. I hear the Lord say that I will give you the Arab nations. I said, sure not. Like, I will give you the Arab nations. Arab nations are going to open to you. I said, what, serious? Really? Uh, yeah, because we bring light in the darkness, and something, when something is broken in the darkness, things will happen, right? And so, now, you have to understand, this is my first time to London. Nobody knows who I am. They decided to do a healing meeting, and I asked them, where do you want the healing meeting to be? They say, Winchester Chapel. I said, wow. So, in my mind, I was like, are you sure? Because nobody knows who I am. So I hate to disappoint you. I have very little faith. Yeah? Because I don't know who is going to show up. But uh, it was full. Which was interesting. It was full. Uh, and, and I naturally thought maybe there's another Winchester Chapel, the small one. Uh, you know, you, it's like, you know, you have many churches of Singapore, maybe there's more. But it was the actual Winchester Chapel. So we went there. Uh, it was interesting because um, this was my first meeting in London. We were, I was there to train the marketplace people how to hear the voice of God in the marketplace setting. And they set this up. And said this word about God bringing light into darkness into the Arab nations, the wealth of the Arab nations. So I was there. Uh, meeting was slow. Um, this lady stood up. Uh, I don't know why English people are so direct. I, 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 it never occurred to me. She, she stood up like and says, I don't understand a single word you say. Like, it's English, like, you know? And, and uh, oh, okay. Oh, that's great. But uh, does carries mean anything? And she said, oh my gosh, that's my name. I said, oh, okay, so now you understand. And so, and the, the meaning actually came alive. Uh, there was this guy from, he's the president of the Blind Foundation. He's blind. Well, we pray for him. And he got healed. So the president of the Blind Foundation got healed. So it's no longer the blind leading the blind, which was, which was really exciting. And suddenly things started to happen. And there was this guy at the side who was wearing this uh, very old school turquoise tuxedo. Looks like Austin Powers kind, you know? Like, uh, and, and, and he was there, he was folding his arms because my friend brought him. And my, he was really annoyed with the speaking in tongue thing. He was really annoyed with all these miracle things. But he was not annoyed because I called the name of this lady Caris, right? And he says, okay, this is very interesting, but I don't believe in all these tongues. He's a Catholic, right? So he decided to came, come out and try. So we have this uh, tunnel, we, we pray for people. And so he was lining up and suddenly he came to me and he looked at me and, and I look at him and says, no, I don't know whether you, uh, I don't know whether this makes sense or not. I see a M-A-N-A-T-A -A -A and continue on. And he said, oh my God, that's my last name. <laughs> so he got his wish. Like, like, he was more fascinated than God knows his name. Like, I, if you have a word of knowledge about my name, I already know my name today, so it's not really exciting to me. Yeah, I already know my handphone number, so you need to tell me my handphone number. But to him, it was really exciting because God knows his name. He was so excited, and he started to tear. He says, what is God saying? God... He knows your family name because you lost many businesses. You lost three businesses and He is about to restore it in five months' time. You're going to own a lot of businesses in five months' time. So just get ready. And so then um, COVID happens. And it says, this is not possible. Oh, no, no. Actually, before that, uh, he went to tell the daughter. And the daughter is a lawyer. And so she met me the next day and uh, the daughter said, I'm not going to tell you anything. Since you can hear Jesus, you just ask Jesus whatever he wants to say to me. He said, oh, that's very simple. You need healing in your womb. And he smiled and said, okay, uh, so let me pray for you. I prayed for her. Uh, not, uh, then I went off. And uh, next day, uh, the father called and says, you're not going to believe what happened. My daughter, 
her period has never stopped ever since it started. When she was 13 years old, it just continued bleeding. I was sharing this same testimony somewhere else, and I just received uh, 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 a testimony that the menstrual issues got healed again a few days ago. And so, uh, and yesterday night, the bleeding completely stopped. And she says, okay, uh, we, we, we need to check this out. Yeah? Just wait for one month, just in case anything happened. You know? if, if it's God, you need to verify, right? So we waited one month, and I call him and says, she's completely healed. So then COVID happens. Now, you know the economy of the kingdom has no financial crisis, right? <laughs> just to let you know. Heaven's economy has no financial crisis. Earth has. And so and I told him that heaven has no economy crisis, though, just to let you know. That if, if God call you, right, that means you are in this economy. You're not flowing in the world's economy, right? So he waited. In month number five, he became the CEO of 10 different companies. Guess who is the head of that? Arab nations. So in five months' time, there was a country that went through a political shift. The opposition actually won. And it's an Arab nation. It's one of those stunts that you can think, right? And so the government picked the wife as the person that is in charge of the sovereign wealth of the whole nation. He, the husband went to her and shared, you got to talk to this pastor. He knows everything and God is real. God calls me by name. He got saved, by the way. The only reason why he got saved because God knows my name. That's great. God knows your name. Uh, and, 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 uh, and so, on a day where I was at Parkway, uh, there was this phone, it just rang, it's this random country code that I felt like I needed to pick up. And suddenly, there's, uh, our, there was a video call, so I, video, I, I kind of pressed the video button, and it says, Hi, this is so-and-so's wife. Uh, I heard what you did to the husband. Can you, I, I heard what you did to my husband. Can you do it on me? He says, oh, okay. Uh, I mean, I am in coffee bean, so I have to make something nice, you know, like the background a bit nicer and stuff. And so I managed to pray for her and managed to call out some things about the nation. And, uh, and then I pray for the foreign minister. I pray for the home affairs minister. And then uh, they asked like, they asked me, like, can, can you teach us how to do it? I said, absolutely. They are, they are Muslims, of course. Okay. Can you teach us how to do it? He said, yeah, very simple. You just fly me over. He says, okay, we're going to fly you over. So uh, the, that, was bef- uh, that was during COVID that the Ministry of Health is supposed to fly us over. <laughs> yeah, the Minister of Health is supposed to grant the visa. So that's story number two. Story number three that involved... Sharu. <laughs> uh, uh, in in um, last story, don't worry, I promise this is the last story. If you, in case you get bored, right? Are you all bored? No, okay, good, good, good. Uh, yeah. Uh, and and um, uh, in the early 1990s, we were actually praying, we were praying, asking God, is there, a, is there any. I, my area is music. Yeah, I use music quite a lot. Uh, and so, uh, and, and kind of asked a lot. So I used to be a DJ to bring light in the darkness. So in Muhammad Sultan, uh, we got quite a number of people say. And so I, and, and we, we were prayer walking in Singapore. And uh, we said, Lord, what is the hardest music to reach out to? And uh, we came across substation. How uh, many substation? Substation. There was this. There's this poster there, and there's this pentagram there. There's an upside down cross. They said, Wow, it's a death metal festival. And you know, I have no idea what death metal is, and my friend has no idea what death metal is. We just paid fifteen dollars. We went in. We went in. Uh, it's either a great awakening or a rude awakening. So for us, it was a rude awakening because it was like uh, it's a uh, uh, 300 over people, they, 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 I don't know whether you know mosh pit, uh, body surfing, people, uh, they got something called war of death, you know, war of death, the Shahru, you know, war of death, it's like 50 people on the left, 50 people on the right, on the count of 10, they crash onto each other, it's called war of death, it's not war of Jericho, I understand, Christian know war of Jericho, you shout, then the war comes down, right, this, you collide together, and people get injured, and, and I was, we, we were like, okay, what are we supposed to do here, uh, and, and we understand 
that as much as hell is happening on earth, heaven is full of possibilities, earth is full of problems. In heaven, there's no problems, agree? Yeah? If heaven is a problem, I don't want to go there. Yeah? But heaven is no problem. Heaven is full of possibilities. That's why Jesus says, all things are possible for those who believe. So therefore, He wants you to see from a perspective of possibilities rather than problems. Most of the time, we get upset and not seeing what God is setting up. Because your upset will cause you to look at the problem. And if you ask the Lord the reverse question, what, is God, what are you setting up? Then you see it from the heaven's perspective. And so we ask the Lord, okay, how are we going to redeem this, right? I mean, there's darkness, there's noise. I don't know whether any of you, I can't do it now. I, any of you have heard death metal before? Whoa, you're going to die, die. Yeah, 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 I know. Don't, don't, don't worry, I'm born again. Yeah, everything is death, murder, die. Uh, uh, nobody understands what they're singing. It sounds like someone having a bad day in the toilet. It's a verse, chorus, it sounds the same. Uh, and I don't understand. Like, and in my mind, it's like, I, I have no idea what they're singing. And me and my friend Eddie, we decided to say, well, we have, I have an idea. Maybe we should record like Psalms. We should record the Bible. We just sing out the Bible. The Lord is my shepherd. You know, I shout. Uh, yes, you know, because they can't understand anyway. But the Word of God will, will go forth and not return to you void, right? You might as well let them hear the Bible, right? So, so we decided to go to Eddie's house and recorded five songs. Psalms 1, a righteous man is like a... <laughs> uh, Psalms 23, Psalms 24, Revelation 1, Revelation 2, no Psalm 119. Some of you don't know. Go and read Psalm 119. Very long. You will run out of breath. Yeah? No Psalm 119. And so we decided, we don't know what we're going to do. We're just going to lay hands on the songs in Jesus' name. We know the Word of God, right? In Jesus' name. And we send it to uh, many this, many this. We send it to US. We send it to different countries. And there was this record label that kind of like messaged us, emailed us and said, we like your songs. So, <laughs> yeah, Black Light Records. Yeah, and see, we want you to be in our compilation. So there were about 10 bands. You actually still can find on Amazon. But don't buy it. I don't like what I sing anyway. Uh, and, 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 it was, and so you have fin Finland bands, you have uh, British bands, you have American bands. Then you have this Singapore band, which has only two Chinese guys, which is smiling at you. The rest of the photos are like, you know, their, their eyes is always like white, and they can't, you know, right? You know, metal people, they are no, always not happy on and their eyes are always white. <laughs> and, and so we, we got a whole chunk of CDs back, like CDs, you know. Some of you don't know CDs, go and ask your mom. It's not a mirror, okay? And, and so we brought it back, and we started to sell it. And then one day, the local metal gig organizers would <laughs> call us and say, would you like to play in our, our metal festival in World Trade Center? <laughs> your band number three, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. And so we said, yes, let's go, let's do it. This is our chance to bring light into darkness. Let's go. So we went there. We had no idea what we we're doing. We had no idea. Like, there were 400 people there. We had no idea what we were doing. Uh, all I know was, well, until band number three, there were bottles throwing. Do you get that a bottle? You got a bottle. Someone was throwing bottles and like, people were fight. There were at least two, three fights. It was like so chaotic as it's how is light going to come in? It's like, did I hear God wrongly? It was just a little experiment though. And, and so I, uh, so they, they went off to we band number four. I took the mic. I did one of the serious things. Maybe it's a God thing. I took the mic. The, my first statement was, these songs are about God. <laughs> which... Which, uh, thank God there's only two persons. Uh. Our drummer is a drum machine. So, so we, I, I step back just in case you can see bottles flying. You can do the whole dodge thing. And, and uh, we started Psalms 1. The righteous man is like a lift. Uh, and still waters and, and Psalms 2. Eh, sorry, Psalms 23, Psalms 24. The earth is lost and the fullness thereof. It is a dwell within. And then, uh, it's king of glory. Lord. It's a perfect song, right? The Lord's trying mighty. Oh, let the king of glory come in. That's the best psalm to sing. Right? They might not understand. Whatever. Right? And, and, and so, uh, Revelations 1, Revelations 2, uh, we are the only band that everybody sat down. I don't know whether you have been to a rock concert. It's either you hit bang, or you body surf, you, you be aggressive. Yes! Right? 
But we are the only band that everybody sat down. I, I, and uh, the Mohawks were there, the, the, the skinheads, the punk rockers, they're all there, they all sat down. And when we finished all our five songs, they all stood up and they started to clap. And, and, uh, and the owner, the owner, the Chinese guy came and said, oh, I'm so happy about your band. Your band is the only band that had no fights. I know, but uh, it doesn't look good. It really doesn't look good. <laughs> yeah, this is not a jazz concert, mind you. And, and so I went outside, I'm still confused, right? And, and I was selling my CDs. There's this group of Mohawk guys that came. I call them the Pokemons, like Mohawk. Uh, how, do you know the secret of Mohawks? You know how they, you want to know the secret? Egg white. Egg white. So on a sunny day and you're hungry, <laughs> and, and they came and said, bro, your music is awesome. I said, well, it doesn't, in my mind, it doesn't, uh, doesn't sound awesome to me. Oh, we want to buy a CD. He's like, yeah, it's really awesome, but I don't know why. It's the same, but it's different. <laughs> Can you elaborate what's same and different? Well, it's the same, but, the, but it's different. I, I don't know why. When, I, I, when you play your songs, I became happy. I cannot feel ang- I, I feel happy. I don't know why. These songs are supposed to be anger, rage, violence, and somehow <laughs> I, feel ha- I feel happy. Like, I feel happy. <laughs> it's like, I, yes, in my mind, I make metal people happy. <laughs> and, and then there was this Chinese guy that came. Uh, he, he, I don't know why. He, he came and uh, he says, he just put his hands on the shoulders, my shoulders, and said, bro, I don't know why I'm telling you this. I used to be a Christian. He tell me the church that he went to, I was very jaded. I was depressed. I took drugs. I fight, and, and, and I, I went to hardcore music, and, and you know, like, and, and, and nothing seemed to satisfy. But tonight, I feel like I want to go back to church on Sunday. They say, wait, the question, the problem is, there's nothing. I didn't wear a fish T-shirt or Jesus loves you. Or a name tag, hi, my name is Elder Jeff. Oh no, that one is Mormon. <laughs> yeah, I didn't wear anything that tells me that I'm a Christian. And, and so of course, I kind of asked him, like, why are you telling me this? Uh? Why, why are you telling me this? He says, because, I don't know why, because when you play your song, it feels like I'm in worship again. It matters whose hands, the, the, the guitar, the, the, the mic, is just an instrument. Paul says you're an instrument for righteousness. Your body is an instrument for righteousness. It matters whose hands is the mic on. If it's on a joyful person, the joyful person will release joyful songs. If it's in a depressed person's hand, the guitar will release depressed songs. The world, the business is full of depressed person, corrupted people, but when it is in the hands of a joyful Christian, when in the hands of an anointed Christian, businesses will transform. And so these are my three stories. And and so I share with him, and he says, okay, very simple, you have three stories. Now I'm going to show you a list. Uh, one verb, the, your call process involves two words, one verb and one noun. Uh, can we show the verb? Uh, can, can we show the verb? So he showed me this list of uh, verbs, uh, that, that, and he says, okay, you need to choose one. All your three stories have something in similar. You can find about three of them, you can find three of them um, and mix and match. So I was thinking about my, 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 my stories, right? The, the gangster one, then you have the, the, the Arab Nations one, and then you have the music, right? You have the metal story. And so I say, now, now interestingly, I could choose like uh, maybe, uh, it seems like oh, I always bring light into darkness, or maybe I use the word awakening, right? Awakening. Because everywhere I go, somehow it seems like when I go into a place of darkness, something is awakened. It's possible. Or igniting is possible. Because I go in, suddenly some spark happens, suddenly things started to illuminate. Oh, or illuminating, right? Illuminating. So I kind of like have uh, igniting, illuminating, uh, 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 awakening. Uh, and now all these blanks, right? You actually, these are not a full list of verbs. So you can fill in your own verb if you find uh, your own verb that you find suitable. The next uh, now, igniting people or igniting lives. Because somehow when I go into the places, uh, lives are being transformed, right? Uh, or awakening communities. Uh, and, and so I choose communities and, 
and, and, and lives or people. Uh, and then suddenly I kind of change. I can, you can fill in your own blanks. And I realize that all these three stories have something similar. That when I go in, I start to shift the atmosphere. So it seems that everywhere I go, I went in, I did something, whether it's songs or whether it is a word of knowledge or whether it, it is or healing, suddenly the whole atmosphere started to shift and nations started to get affected. People groups started to get affected. So I decided to, like, it, because it is not just lives that has been transformed, it is the atmosphere of the whole place. Now the biggest fire is feeding the poor everywhere they go. And now they're like changing uh, all their business model into chicken rice stores, which is okay, like better eat chicken rice. Not bad, uh, chicken rice, really not bad. Yeah? Uh, and, and so I realized that it was everywhere I go, I, when I come in, I'm the deciding factor whether something shifts or not. So I choose the word shifting, and then I choose the word atmosphere because it's not just people that shift, it's the whole place, the atmosphere become a culture of love, or somebody, they felt something more than just transformation. They felt peace, joy, happy. They felt repentance, they felt like they need to feed the poor, something like that. So I decided to choose shifting atmosphere. The good thing about the core process with these two words are, everywhere you go, when you wake up, you are still shifting atmosphere. When I wake up, I don't need a stage to define my calling. Because if it's no longer an event, if it's a lifestyle, that means when I wake up, everywhere I go, I'm always shifting atmosphere. It doesn't matter it's in an MRT, it doesn't matter it is in a Grab driver. And so, everywhere I go, my core process, the core of who I am is, if there is darkness, I will go to ship it in Jesus' name. So my core process is shifting atmosphere. On a good day, on a bad day, you wake up, you lost your identity, you don't know who you, who you are. Jeff, you are called to shift atmosphere. I don't know whether you all understand SNS and PNS. These are nervous systems that our body kind of react to or body are in. PNS is a state where you, you are most joyful, you are relaxed, your body starts to heal itself. That's called PNS. Synaptic nervous system. Yeah, so uh, it starts to heal itself, you are more relaxed, you are enjoying what you do, it gives you energy, and your body automatically starts to restore itself. Yeah, and a lot of sickness get healed faster. On the other hand, will be SNS. SNS is a fight or flight mode, we call it in consultant terms, fight or flight. That means when you count a problem you encounter, you either fight it, but if the enemy is too big, you run away. Now, if you look at National Geographic, you will come across this video of this rabbit and this eagle trying to hunt the rabbit down. So it's like, now if you are strong enough, you can fight your enemy, but if you are a rabbit and there's an eagle, you also can't run fast enough. So what this rabbit did was, the rabbit played dead. Right? You've seen those videos about play dead. But in that state, it's the worst state that you can ever be in. That's an SNS state. It means that your body is stiff out in a place you pretending to die, it relax, but you cannot relax because every time the enemy goes away, immediately you need to jump out and you run. That state is the worst state. That state, a lot of stress, heart attack, heart issues, your nervous system started to break down. Sometimes the problem with Singaporeans are, and I met quite a number of them, is they don't enjoy what they do. Out of 30 days in your marketplace, you only enjoy one day, which is a payday. Then, more than 90% of the time, you are not enjoying what you do. So you are in a place where I need to bring bread back to my family. I don't enjoy what I do. It's a state, you're the rabbit. You don't like what you do. You're, playing, you, you're just slowly dying inside. That's what it is. That's why a lot of sickness comes. A lot of high blood pressure and a lot of sickness and disease came. So we are in this state where we fight or fly. We don't like what we do. We don't like what you do. Already. You do it. You don't like. You also complain. And then you complain on social media. You complain on mothership, fathership, whatever. In the end, it's you, you live a miserable life of neg negativity. Now, I'm not saying that you should like 100% what you like to do. 
But a perfect, I'm not asking you to quit your job also. So don't, don't, don't say that, that my pastor, Pastor Jeff told me. No, no. It's maybe a 60, 40 percent. To realign your life, maybe a 50, 50 percent. The 50 percent, you like what you do, 50 percent. Also, there are times where I do everything while I'm a pastor. I do every single thing. Sweep floor, clean the toilet, and all the stuff. You know? And, and so, maybe a 60, 40, but 90 is where your body starts to enter into SNS when you get stressed, tired. When you go home, your family cannot enjoy who you are because you're just so sick and tired for 8 hours or 12 hours a day. And that's what we are trying to do to navigate your life to this place where you find out your core of who you are and start to realign your life. You understand? Now, uh, I want you to look at the verbs and the nouns. Uh, let's go to the verbs. Now, think of three happy stories right now. Uh, some of you, shoot off your mind, you will know those three happy stories. Just relax, connect with the Holy Spirit. And it asks a lot right now. Yes, this is an exercise. Everybody do it, yeah? So, right now, Lord, what is the three happy stories that I have? That, that I have that give me the most energy. Yeah? You can write it down. You can write it down. It says, Lord, yeah, you, you, when you do it, wow, you, you have the buzz. You, in the morning, you wake up, you're still talking about it one month later. You feel the, find the most satisfaction. Even though you're not paid, you still do it. Now, out of those three stories, right, there is, for my stories, it's always shifting atmosphere. There are something similar in those three stories. I want you to find three verbs or more here and write it down. Three verbs or more and write it down. Now, for sure, you're not going to get your, some of you will not going to get your, you're not going to get your core process within one, two tries. Because this one, you need to process with the Lord. Yeah? So, the verbs, uh, write down three. If those of you who have three stories, then you just write down, uh, look at the verbs and just write down what are the common denominator of all three stories. You just write down a few verbs. You can come up with your own verbs. Igniting, transforming. Uh, I came up with shifting myself, but it's not here. Championing, uncovering. I know a lady, all her three stories, but first story, she went to Hillsong, she saw the dustbin. They said, Hillsong, but the dustbin is so nice, and she started to cry. So I know. Like, it's, and then she went to battle, and she went to battle, and she saw, wow, everything was so nice, it was all organized. And she went to the bookstore and said, oh, everything is so organized. And she started to cry. And then she went to, what is that church? Willow Creek? Yeah, Willow Creek. It's like everything is so organized. It's like, wow, the structures and the systems is there. And it's like, all oh, the, and, and then she started to cry because of the flyer. It was so well organized. And, and I was thinking, and, and she says like, wow, these are not very, these are very simple stories. I know because all three founders has already built a legacy in their life. You're crying not because of the dustbin. You're crying because... I'm not talking... Like, I understand Hillsong and whatever it is, but I'm talking about Hillsong then. But all these founders, right, have actually built a legacy that lasts for generations. You're crying because you see that chair, you see their flyer, is because from where they were, they built this organization that transformed the whole world. So your core process is really building a legacy. And she, she cries some more and says, that's exactly it. I want to build legacy. Now, let's go to the now. And so you can look at the now, find three uh, nows. And you can kind of like mix and match this and start to um, look at the verbs and the nouns and come up with uh, simple core processes. Yeah, look at the nouns. Now connect with the Lord right now. With those verbs and nouns, connect with the Lord right now. I said, Lord, 
Can you show me which one to use? Who I really am? Now, you need to understand this. This is very important because Second Peter chapter 1, verse 9 to 11. Uh, uh, verse, verse 9 to 11. Uh, okay, 10 to 11. Uh, Wherefore, brethren, labor more, that by good works you may be sure of your calling and election. For if you do these things, you shall not sin at any time. Now, I understand there's a lot of sermon that says so that kind of keep us away from sinning. We live a holy life, whatever it is. Peter offered a different perspective. Not that he says, if you if you understand your calling and election, you will not fall. You will not sin. Now that's something that has never been taught. But if you understand who you are and what you're wired to do, this is one way of not sinning. This is very interesting. I didn't say it, uh, Bible say it. Peter said, Second Peter said, Yeah. So, uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, verse uh, chapter 10, verse 12 to 15. It says, For we are bold not to compare ourselves by another. If we measure themselves by themselves, they are not without understanding, or it says they are not fruitful. That means if I compare with another person, right? I'm not fruitful. It's without understanding because I don't understand who I am. Paul, uh, sorry, Saul heard the song. Saul killed 10,000. David killed 10,000. If and it became the iTunes number one song. And he was very insecure. And in the King James translation, it says, on that day, Saul's eyes was on David. His, his eyes was no longer on his own race. He was on David was jealousy because someone was better than him. And because of that, his calling started to fall. And which is true in this, that if you go and find out who you are and what you're wired to do, your eyes will be forever on another person or you pretending to another person. God's anointing only fall on the true, authentic self. If you're not authentic to yourself, the anointing will not fall. He doesn't need you to pretend like someone else. He wants you to be you. All right? So, uh, it, it says that we do not boast beyond our measure, yeah? Which is the measure of the sphere that God has appointed us. Verse 14, it says, For we do not overextend ourselves. The word overextend, it means to push yourself to a place where you don't want to be. You, you stretch yourself too far. How many of you do things that you don't like? You feel like, wow. You, you, you do things you don't like, it's not your call, it's not other people's mess, you're not fixing, you're overextending yourself. What Paul is saying is there's a measure, there's a sphere. The word sphere is where we get the word, free word called metron, the sphere of influence. So if you understand who you are, then you set your boundaries that you won't overextend yourself. Yeah? Now, how many of you have three stories already and you have your, roughly your core process, can you raise up your hands? Uh, can you come up? Hello, what is your name? Huh? Regina. Okay, come, come, come. What is your three stories? First is I experienced deliverance from demonic oppression. Second is healing from multiple chronic sicknesses. I was suffering from suicide, depression, asthma, bronchitis, sleep disease, sclerosis. Leaky gut syndrome, irritable bowel syndrome, shibu sopu, zizhong yao hui fa sao, zizhong yao hui xue peng. Yeah, everything healed by the Lord. Because they gave me injection, you cannot stop the bleeding. So I turned to God, and then after that, I was inspired by my pastor, because my pastor is a prophetic pastor. So I asked God for a double portion of anointing, and I didn't tell anyone. Then the same week, my pastor came to me, laid hands on me, and asked for a double portion of anointing, and I started to have open visions. Yeah. What's the third song? Anointing. I just said, my pastor laid hands on me and I received the anointing. Okay, the first story, the first story is you got few Deliverance. Okay. Second is healing. Third is anointing. Third is anointing. What does the anointing do? What is the anointing that you ask for? I asked for Elijah's, uh, no, Elijah double portion anointing. Okay. So it's prophetic. Okay. Yeah. And what is your verb and noun that you have? Uh... 
The last yeah. is people, lives, and generations. People, lives, and generations. Yeah, can okay. I go upstairs. Uh, now? The, no, this is the now, it's not the verb. I need okay. to look at the oh, verb. Oh, sorry. Verb? Yeah, so the verb is uh, revealing, uncovering, and discovery. Revealing, uncovering, and discovery. Mm. Revealing, uncovering, and discovery, people, life, or generations. Yes, usually the Lord will use me to um, prophesy whether I are in the fivefold ministry and their spiritual giftings. Okay. Yeah. So you're more like a, 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 a more in the spiritual matron, uh, that means? Yes, correct. Okay. Yes. So why generations? Can I because ask? When, when, let's say you're a Christian, right? You want to marry another Christian so you can hand down a Christian legacy to your children so that your okay. children will grow up to serve the Lord and to fulfill whatever the Bible says. Okay, what about the other one? Like, uh, So what, what core process do you came up with? If you combine those two, like what, what sounds great to you that when you read those two verbs and nouns that it's really exciting? Uh, prophetic utterances. Uh, anything here? Prophetic evangelism. Oh, no, no, no. A verb? Okay. What verb do you use? Okay. Uh, I said discovery. Discovering. Revealing and one more, right? Discovering or revealing? Yes. Okay. Then discovering or revealing. Okay. Let's say discovering. Okay. What are the nouns? Can you shift to the noun? People, lives and generations. People, lives or generations. Yeah. Discovering generation, discovering or revealing generation. Yeah, revealing, revealing their calling, generations. their destinies, okay. their spiritual giftings. Okay, yeah. that's one the prophetic. Yes. Revealing yes. generations. And uh, can I have your name again? Rexina. Rexina. Uh, when you see another person that is bounded by the enemy, you're not satisfied. Yes. Because you want them to be set free. Yes, correct. Because it's not just setting them free, it's setting the rest of their family yes. free and to, for the rest yes. of the generations correct. to correct. come. Correct. Yeah? Yes. It is to reveal generations. Yes, correct. It's to reveal the true identity of every single person that is son and daughter of God yes. has a destiny in Jesus. Yes, correct. So, Rexina, your core process is revealing generations. Yes. Do you feel that? Yes, correct. You feel the weight yes. of the Holy Spirit. Because I told God, I say I dedicate my children to God. I ask God to fill my kids with the Holy Spirit and to anointing and okay. the power and everything while That's they're good. in my womb. So yeah. revealing generation, do you have do you have a good vibe about that? You can just mix and match mm. back home because your story is much. Thank you so much. Yeah, you, you can you, because your story is much. Thank you so much. Your stories might change. So because it's an exercise that uh, we suddenly just pull, so go back and process with Lord because there, there are more things. And find something that when you speak the word and now, it means something to you. There's weight on it. Okay? Yeah. Thank you so much. Is there a marketplace person here that have the three stories and two, the, the, their words called, called, their call process, the words and the nouns? Anyone? Yes. What do you have? What is your name? My name is Esther. Esther. Hi, Esther. Hi. Um, so I, the three stories. Mm, three stories. Um, one of it is seeing salvation, unexpected salvation mm. in a work situation. Like how? In a, um, in a nutshell, how? It was a recruitment interview. Uh -huh. At the end, I somehow during the interview sensed that I need to ask him whether he wants to receive Christ. Well, that's um, amazing. And just to keep Good it to professional, see. I waited to the uh -huh. end. So I said, "This marks the end of the interview. Do you mind if we chat a bit more?" And then I said, cool. "You know, do you believe in the Bible? Do you things like that?" Oh, wow, cool. um, when it was a crowded Starbucks, and so when. He actually said yes to mm. the sinners, saying the sinner's prayer. I was surprised, caught <laughs> off guard, um, wasn't used to it. Um, so I just tried to remember how to say it. Yeah, butterflies when you got that, right? Yes. Like this. That's great. Yes. Next story? Um, the next story was, uh, it's, it's quite simple, seeing beauty. Okay. Um, and because you said like moments where you cry yeah, and yeah. enjoy. So it's spread across different situations mm -hmm. as long as it's... Something truly beautiful. One, one significant one. Sunsets. Sunset. Like beautiful sunsets. Okay. Or actually every sunset. 
Yeah. Um, there'll be times where I sense the Holy Spirit tell me to go for a walk or stand at a certain place. Mm. And true enough, there would be that angle would allow me to see a beautiful sunset. All right, that's good. Story number three. Um, the third one uh, was finding truth. Um, right. Okay, what is the story? I I don't really know how to explain it, but uh, for example, when I sense something is a bit off, and then maybe by praying or by asking certain things, is there a scenario? It uncovers. Is there a scenario? Mm. Maybe in a certain group, uh, I had sensed that the the two two of the cell group, mm. two of the people were actually one person is actually interested in the other, mm. um, and then uh, you know sh sh I I didn't want to say anything, um, and then I uh, accompanied her oh. to go for a walk with that person mm. to create a safe atmosphere. Okay. Yeah. That's a matchmaker anointing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. That's yeah. good. Oh, okay. And and did they got together? Did they get married or what? Uh, no, it's still in progress. Still in progress, yeah. but they they started. You you just ignite something, uh? uh, I didn't do it purposely. I just sense that there's oh, something, cool. and I sense I need to be there. That's great. So all of you single now. Just kidding. <laughs> okay. Uh, what are the verbs that you have? Like, uh, what are, what are the verbs you have? Um, the first one is bringing joy. Bringing. Uh, yeah. Verbs bringing, jo uh, bring, bringing bringing joy. Okay. Uh, so, okay. What what are the verbs bringing and what do you have bringing? Bringing seeking truth. Uh huh. And shifting atmosphere as well. Oh really? Cool. Okay. What about the nouns? Uh, so it's joy, truth, and atmosphere. Joy, truth, and atmosphere. Yeah. Now let me recap those stories. All those stories, right, are bringing joy, bringing joy, okay? All those stories, right, has something in common. We're looking for similarities, yeah? something in common. Salvation is beauty. Sunset is beauty. People coming together is beauty. Why not use beauty? Because joy is one thing, though. Joy is the offspring of something. Because when you see something beautiful, then suddenly joy is a byproduct of that. So beauty. When the person got saved, it was a beautiful sight where Jesus entered into their heart and actually completely changed their life. When you see the sunset, it's a moment of the nature called Romans chapter 1 that is undeniable. The nature talks about when you see nature and God speaks to you, through beauty you understand who God is. Then the third one is well, the divine matchmaking where they're coming together and you at the side seeing those two, that beauty, something beautiful actually can happen. So all three, your thought is something beautiful can come out of this interview, this walk, and this dinner. So what are the verbs that if it's a lot now it's beauty, what is the verb that you are? Buffing beauty, finding beauty. Hmm. You, what is that? What word will you use? Maybe cultivating. Cultivating beauty. But in all three stories, I think you are the one that initiated it, right? You are the seed planter. Right? Under the instruction of the Holy Spirit. Uh, of course, under the instruction <laughs> of the Holy Spirit. Is there anything that... I was thinking cultivating... Awakening beauty. I was thinking cultivating, cultivating because it why? takes um, Oh, it takes effort. time. It takes effort from It takes time the people. and effort. Okay, cultivating. Okay. Uh, let's, this is called the initiation process. There's only one way to find out whether it's your call process. Esther? Cultivating beauty, right? Esther, when something is ugly and sorrowful, when something is left there, and when you step down there in the mud in different things that's covering that person or that situation, there's always something that you see beyond the mess and the pain of a certain person or a certain thing. And you saw beauty before they become beautiful. Whether it's a relationship, whether it's a sunset that needs to walk, or whether it's a person that is about to enter into heaven, you saw the outcome that's prophetic before it happened. 
Yeah. So, but the opposite is true, that when the world comes to this place where they are disappointed, they are fall into this place where they are hopeless, they have no desire to live. Suicide and depression is one of those things that you are against because it goes opposite of cultivating beauty. Because depression is ugly. Depression is finding mean, there's no meaning to live, no hope left. And you are on this journey where if there's a person that is depressed or they are in sadness, you will cultivate something. You will bring them up to life because there is beauty in their life. They have not seen it yet. So Esther, your core process is cultivating beauty. Do you feel that? How do you feel? Um, it's accurate. I just want to say one thing, yes. the word defender comes to mind. Defender. I'm not sure what to make of it. That's great. You can go back and process, uh, but look for similar things. Look for similar things. Thank you so much, Esther. Now, I have limited time, so uh, I, I, I'm going to tell you this, though. What I did is an initiation ceremony. In during World War II, I'll finish with this, in during World War II, when the Japanese lost, uh, how many of you have watched Oppenheimer? <laughs> when the Japanese lost and uh, uh, the West won, uh, the interesting thing is when the Japanese went back to Japan, the PTSD rate and the depression uh, actually is way, 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 way less than the West. A lot of the American soldiers, when they go back, they have PTSD, they end up taking jobs that is connected to violence or force, whether it's a policeman, security guard, uh, because there are a lot of trauma, a lot of drug cases, a lot of uh, very, very bad uh, depression. And so, but the, the interesting thing is Japan lost. And if you understand Japan culture, it's an honor and shame culture. So in, in natural fact, right, the Japanese culture should be the one that is suffering more. Right? They, should, they value honor highly. Right? You know, right? And so, now, then suddenly I discovered there's this very interesting ceremony that when the soldiers went back to Japan, they all went through this ceremony. It's called the loyal soldier. It's very simple. Uh, it's called an initiation ceremony. Uh, the, the soldier is going to be placed in the room, and there are 20 of these maybe good friends, wife, students. They all come together. People that know that it's connected with him. Yeah, before he left for the war. They sat down, and he is in the middle, and they affirm him and says, you are a husband, you are a great father. You remember you did this? You went on a, you went on a circus, and you played with your son, and, and you went, we went for a roller coaster. Remember that? And the, then the students will come and say, you are my teacher. I'm an engineer now. I won't be where I am to, without you. And so all these 20 people or 30 will slowly, it can take one or two hours, reaffirming this person in the middle of the room. And then, uh, this person will be receiving all the information. At the last part, will be the commanding officer coming into the room uh, and say, stand up. Right now, you're coming back to Japan to be a husband, to be a teacher. Right now, I want to discharge your loyal soldier into the ball field. You don't need to fight anymore. The fighting part of you is in a battlefield. Now, Come back here to be who you are, your true identity, your husband, your teacher, your, you, you, your loving father. And because of the little ceremony, it helps that culture. And what I did right now, just now, right, is reaffirming the core process in every single person. Uh, I can't go through every single one because usually this type of uh, core process is easier to do when you have a smaller group, when you do together, it's more intimate. But I already give you the skeleton and the blueprint of how to do it. But when you go home, bring it back to the Lord and kind of connect and ask the Lord to kind of like uh, streamline it in a way where you kind of come up with your core process by yourself. Uh, uh, it, but somewhat affirming and initiating you into that is very important. So this is something that we did to business people. Uh, they realign and shift their, uh, their culture. Thank you so much for listening and bearing with me for <laughs> one hour and 15 minutes. <laughs>